Yeah, this talk uh, is going to be about supercharging AngularJS. Uh, I've tried to, you know, put some of the stuff that I've learned, some of the best practices that I've seen and that I've, uh, you know, figured out over the time, and uh, tried to turn it into a, a slideshow, and uh, we'll walk through it, and hopefully, maybe you'll learn something, maybe we'll discuss something at the end, or on the ways, if, you're, if you want to break in, that's fine with me. Uh, but just, uh, just to make it clear, the wording, so uh, new versions of Angular is called Angular, and everything that's 1.x is called AngularJS. So that's the official wording or naming of, of the frameworks. Uh, so I thought I would, uh, I would make it interesting for myself, so I opened a beer. So every time I say it wrong, you, uh, you yell out, skull, and I'll take a sip. So we'll see if I'm uh, still sober at the end. And I hope I, I can make it without uh, drinking too much anyway. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the quick introduction. My name is Philip. Uh, I work here at Impact. Blah, blah, blah. You heard all this already. Uh, last year, I joined uh, Google's uh, Developer Expert uh, program. So uh, I'm pretty excited to, every month, have meetings with the Angular team and the Polymer team and the Chrome team and, and uh, talk to them about where the platform is going and what's up with the frameworks and stuff. So. Uh, I try to keep up to date that way, and, and that's, uh, that's a pretty good, uh, that's pretty good way. So let's talk about AngularJS. Um, so we've been, a lot of us, I thought I would, make, I would talk about AngularJS because a lot of us are probably still using AngularJS in, uh, in our day-to-day -day job or in maybe in old legacy stuff where we've moved on to Angular. Um, but AngularJS is a pretty solid framework, and it's, it's really easy to get started with, and, uh, and there's a lot of stuff built on it already. Uh, so why talk about best practices? Why share all of this? Uh, I thought I would uh, say maybe, you know, for building better apps, uh, so we can have less errors, we can have better performance, we can work together better as teams uh, to have more fun, and, you know, to get closer to how Angular works. So it doesn't count when it's on the slide. Uh, so the first thing I've, uh, I've, I've ch tried to change my mind about is, uh, you know, changing my vocabulary. So I start to think, uh, think about uh, directives and components like they work in Angular. Uh, so AngularJS directives uh, are, can be more or less anything, and AngularJS components are, you know, a very strict definition of of, uh, or just a limitation of, of what a directive can be. So uh, I think it's a really good idea to, uh, to start thinking the Angular way and say, so a component is something that has an element selector and that always has a template, and a directive is something that has an attribute selector and never has a template. So if you, if you think about your uh, components and your, your, uh, your components and your directives that way, uh, it's a lot easier to, to, to talk to teammates about. It's a lot easier to understand what's going on. And when you read uh, markup or when you read HTML or, or you know, templating, uh, it's very easy to reason about that every time there's an element, uh, you know that there's a, a template associated with it. And every time there isn't one, you know that there's not going to be a, a template select, uh, you know, associated with it. And then obviously, you know, the, the modern way of thinking of your applications are as a tree of components. So I think most of you have probably heard this before. Uh, a lot of you are probably doing this, so I won't go too much into it, but I thought I'd just, you know, show it if, if somebody hasn't, uh, hasn't been doing it already. I'd just say, so this could be uh, how our app would work. So it would have a, a root component and at the top. Uh, that will have maybe some navigation in a component, and then we'll have a contact list component, and that will then iterate over some contact items, and, and they'll all be their individual components. So in markup, it'll look something like this, but it's, it's more or less the same. You know, there's the app and the contact list and the navigation, and then there's the items that are repeated inside the, uh, the, the contact item. Um, so the way to think about this is, uh, you know, Dumb components and smart components. That's what I like to call them. Other people call them stateful components and stateless components, or maybe they'll be called presentational components or something. They can be called, they have multiple names, but the idea is kind of that we have some components that are dumb and that are therefore reusable that you can use in any context because they don't know anything about the context. So that's the definition. They don't know anything about where they're being used. They're just being 
fit some data and then they're showing that and whenever they do something they don't do they don't know what they're doing they're just you know broadcasting events and uh, and I guess that's the next slide so we always pass data down and events is what goes up so in AngularJS we we are able to use you know two-way bindings and all the magic of actually being able to change the data from the bottom and then have something up top or above in the in the in the hierarchy actually catch the, catch it but you shouldn't uh, it's just going to make your app really hard to reason about and what who's who changed what data and where and and all that stuff so start thinking about your apps this way start thinking data always goes down events are what goes up and then somewhere probably in the smart component the, the 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 events will be caught and that can then interact with the service and save the data or change the data or how, how it should work so i guess a lot of you've seen slides on how this looks in angular but i thought i'd also put up a slide that shows how this looks in angular js so here's a product list component and a product component and uh, there's nothing revolutionary about this so there's just a repeater in the, in the product list that repeats over uh, items uh, and shows a product uh, component and will then feed the data as item into the, uh, the product component and will give it a, a callback or a, you know, a, that's how events are, are, are handled in AngularJS where you say, so on buy, then trigger this uh, function inside. So then on the product component, we'll just show the name or whatever and um, and when the button inside the, the product component is clicked, it'll just go around and more or less just trigger the event and send it back up. And up in the product list component, it will then be caught. And that can, you know, here's just alerting, but you, th that's where you would actually then, you know, put it in the basket or save it into the service or whatever you would want to go. So that's how it looks in Angular JS. Uh, and uh, and the, the important part is that uh, the bindings inside of the 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 DOM component, the product component, uh, is that the, the, bi the bindings that, has the, that gets the data in should be a one-way binding, uh, uh, which is with the, with the sh funny, uh, you know, what's it called? Uh, the funny arrow thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then for the events or for, for passing down functions, we'll use the, the, uh, the ampersand symbol. Uh, and that's how you, you pass it around and that's how it will work. So one thing that's, that's a little bit different in how AngularJS handles this is that uh, the, the, you, need to you need to actually set, you know, call the, the callback function, the unbuy function. Uh, you need to call it with an object that has a key, and that key needs to be the same that you're, that you're uh, you know, telling it in the, where you're using it up in line, what is it, seven or something, where it says unbuy control dot buy item. So that item must be the same key as, as we're actually you know, uh, calling the function with. So this is not revolutionary, but, uh, but that's how it works. And it's, and it's pretty easy to see that if you build your application this way in AngularJS, it'll, it's going to be a lot easier if you want to upgrade to Angular or, or if, if you just want to take how you, how you work and, and take the same philosophy or the same approach. Uh, you're, it's very easy if you do it this way. So another good thing, another best practice or something, whatever you want to call it is, you know, have all your business logic and, uh, and data live inside of services. So if you ever see yourself calling $HTTP directly from a component, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, the, the, the components shouldn't know about API endpoints. It should, they should never handle uh, API responses. They should never ha handle response objects. They should only handle data. Uh, so if you're ever calling $HTTP from inside a component, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, so the right way to do it would be to have a service that handle a specific, specific part of your data and that, that service can then know wh what, what the endpoints are and, and what methods to call and, and how, how everything works. So that's, that's how you should, you should try to think about your, uh, your data and, and, uh, and the business logic. And when we're talking about uh, the services, uh, maybe this is a bit opinionated, but I, I, I kind of like that all uh, data calls are consistent. Uh, so, and, and most of the time, some of the data in our services are, are async. So I prefer that all, serv all service methods always return something that's async, so they'll always return a promise, and then if the data is just there, it'll just resolve it, uh, immediately. But that makes it a lot easier to, to reason about um, 
so that you know every time you call the service, no matter what you do with it, it's always async and you always get a, gets back a promise. And uh, that, that makes it a lot easier to, you know, to, to reason about. But I would say, just be consistent about it. So if everything's just local, uh, don't worry about wrapping everything in promises. Just, hand, just give back everything automatically or uh, you know, at once uh, directly. But, uh, but, if, but most of the time, some of the data is async, and then I would prefer everything to be async. Um, then I would say, treat directives like components. So uh, even though you know, on, a, on an AngularJS component, we, there's a, you're, you're able, or on a directive, you're, you're, you're able to call a, a link method. Uh, you can use replace, uh, but all of those are deprecated, or they're not, they haven't made it into what's an Angular component, and that's for good reasons, because uh, they don't really, they, are concepts that does, that does not, does, ugh, that doesn't exist in Angular, uh, but only in Angular JS, uh, and uh, and they don't, they generally don't perform very well, and they have some funny quirks about them. Uh, so think about it, think about your application in a way that doesn't, that where you don't need to use the link function. Uh, there are callbacks on the controllers instead, or lifecycle hooks. Uh, and uh, replace, there are very few uh, places where you would need to use replace, but if you absolutely must, of, of, of course you can, but uh, I'll try to, to refactor my way out of it, so I wouldn't need it. And then there is the dreaded scope. So uh, I guess most of you, when you, uh, or if you have seen the original Angular, when it was called Angular 2, uh, introduction, uh, where with all the tombstones and uh, all the, uh, the ringing, uh, because everything died, uh, the scope was probably the weirdest one, because everybody was like, so what then? Like, how do we get data into the view and all that stuff? Uh, so, but, Scopes are gone with Angular, uh, so we, we, uh, a really good way to, to, uh, to get used to that is, is to stop using it in AngularJS. Uh, and uh, for performance reasons as well, it, it, uh, it's, a lot, it's, it's a little bit better to bind to the controller instead of, uh, of binding directly to the scope. Um, and it comes with a lot of other uh, you know, uh, good, good parts. So, but what is the problem with scope? So, I would say the biggest problem uh, is probably that in AngularJS we have this idea of scope inheritance and, and isolating scopes. And that's just weird and that's just hard to reason about. Uh, and uh, you know, using the controller as syntax, which is you know, the, the way to, the, the, the alternative to using scopes everywhere, uh, is to use the controller as syntax. And, uh, and that handles that very well because you'll actually have controller names so you can you can say so I want to I want to you know bind something to this controller instance on this name and there is no inheritance so there because you know if you if you have if you don't know in Angular JS if you bind something to a scope and it doesn't exist on that scope already but it exists on the parent scope you'll actually get the binding to the parent scope and uh, that's really hard to reason about because then you can change something from inside your uh, your you know from inside your component or whatever or directive and you'll actually change something that lives in a in a whole different uh, area of your application. So you don't want that because it's, it's very hard to reason about. It, that's the, probably the number one thing you want your application for the developer's sake. You want it to be easy to reason about so you understand what goes on. Uh, obviously, the other, the other thing about scope is performance. Uh, yeah, so I say don't use scope. Uh, go for the controller as syntax. That's the new default on, on uh, components. So if you use the dot .component method in AngularJS, uh, you, there won't be a scope or like it, the <laughs> there is a scope, but you know there's a default uh, controller as syntax, and you should just use that. Um, if you really need the event system of Angular JS, uh, you can use the scope because it doesn't affect performance. Uh, but uh, you probably don't need it because it's it it also has the uh, the hierarchical stuff where you can broadcast some places in the, in the scope, and it'll only you know go downwards or go upwards in the scope uh, answers to Gene. So it's just hard to reason about, and you generally don't want that in your application. So when things are slow, you're probably doing it wrong. So AngularJS is actually a pretty good framework. Uh, it, actually, uh, it actually works really well. It can handle a lot of data. It can handle a lot of situations that are really hard to do. 
and especially with Angular JS 1.5 and 1.6, uh, a lot of stuff has been put into performance, and it's actually it actually performs pretty well. Uh, so, of course, it's not always you, and uh, that, but a lot of time, it, a lot of times it is. So I thought I'd just you know go over some of the stuff that I've done that I've found seen myself done, and then said to myself, maybe I shouldn't do this because uh, it hurts hurts performance. So, don't use watch. Uh, what watch, like if you don't know, a watcher on the scope is where you can say, so whenever this thing on the scope changes, give me a callback. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a really uh, expensive uh, operator to use because that way, whenever anything anywhere has changed, it will call your callback just to say, or it will, it will check your, 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 your expression to see if your expression matches what has changed so that your callback needs to be called. And that's why it's so expensive. And that happens every time anything anywhere changes. Uh, so don't do it. Don't use it. And if you really, really must, uh, be very, very specific about what you're actually watching. So uh, when you call watch, there's actually a second argument where you can put a Boolean in that says whether the watch expression should be true or, or should be deep or not. Uh, and if you ever see yourself putting true in that second parameter, you're absolutely doing it wrong. <laughs> it's not just probably anymore, you're absolutely doing it wrong. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, yeah? Yeah, that, that's that, that, that. So probably you should refactor your app so you don't depend on stuff that, that happens somewhere else uh, without you being notified by anything else but the watcher. So um, maybe, you should, uh, maybe you should make a service where you can say, now this piece of data has changed, and then everybody else can subscribe to that service and get, and get a callback. That will work the same way. And then you would be in control of when, this, uh, you know, when the checking would be done. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but you can do it in multiple ways. The other way to do it is that there's actually now a do check uh, lifecycle hook on components. Uh, it's one of the lesser known features of uh, Angular components uh, in 1.5, is that along with on init and on destroy, there's a do check callback or a lifecycle hook. And that's, that's actually being called every time uh, there's, it's checking whether the bindings are the same. So it's kind of similar to how watch works. Uh, it just doesn't watch as broadly uh, as, uh, as the watcher does. It, it just watches uh, the, the, the component itself. But again, you probably don't want that either. You should probably refactor your app. So when it comes to performance, apply is really the root of all evil. So the apply is where, uh, where, <coughs> where, you know, where your performance is, is hurt, because everything in AngularJS calls apply. Um, and that's, the, that's, that's what powers all the magic of AngularJS, where you can just bind to something somewhere and change it somewhere else, and it'll automatically s stay in sync. And that's, that's pretty awesome. That's one of the, the, the superpowers of AngularJS. Uh, but it's also really horrible, because that means we have to check everything all the time, and we can't make any assumptions about what has changed or where it's from and all that stuff. So, and the way Angular handles that like inside its belly is that it's, it's calling this apply method every time something changes. And apply will then go ahead and you know, f trace all your templates again and see what, has, what bindings are there, uh, see if they're still the same, if they're not all updated in the view. It'll do all the watchers, check if the values are the same, if, and if they're not, they'll call the callbacks and all that stuff. So it's really, really expensive. And because of the way two-way data binding works in AngularJS, we can't even just do it once, because what if somebody somewhere else changed something else? Uh, so we will actually, we'll actually do it, by minimum, we'll do it two times every time something changes. So it's actually called the digest cycle, because we'll do it and then do it again, and, uh, and only will it stop when we've had two concurrent runs that are the same. So it's really, really expensive. Uh, so uh, yeah. So you, we, we need to try to avoid this as much as possible because that's where all our problems come from. So whenever you, uh, s you build stuff or whenever you see stuff in AngularJS, you use a lot of uh, the ng uh, directives. So you can say ng click or ng you know, key up or ng something on, a, on, a, on an element somewhere and it will actually get a callback. Uh, the funny thing is that all the ng directives, they actually call apply. 
So if you don't need to opt, if you don't need your action to actually do something with the view, you probably don't need to call use the ng click because you know and what ng click does is really just add an event listener for click and then do what you tell it to do and then call apply at the end. So if you don't need it to call apply, you should probably just find the element yourself, put in, put an event listener on it, you know yourself, and then do whatever you want because that will save the performance. Then you will probably send some data to the server, and then when the server gets the data gets back, then you'll want to call apply, probably, because you, you wanted to show the response or something. But uh, that's a pretty good way to think about it, especially so if you ever s see yourself doing ng mouse move or, or something like that, that is really really heavy and that's called over and over and over again. Uh, if your app is any size, you know, small bigger than a demo app, it'll probably you know break the browser. Uh, so, uh, so you probably don't want that. So instead, as I said, handle your event listeners yourself uh, and only call apply when you need it to. Dolly HTTP also calls uh, apply whenever it's, it resolves or rejects. Uh, the same go for the queue service. So whenever you're using a promise and it resolves or rejects, it'll, it'll automatically call apply for you. Uh, timeouts call apply. Um, more or less the only Angular thing that doesn't call apply are events. So the event system, so when you do dollar on something and listen for something, that doesn't call it dollar apply. So that's a little bit weird actually why it doesn't do that, but it just doesn't do it. So that's why I was, I was saying, if you need an event system, the, the one that's built into the, uh, to the scope th thing is actually okay, because it doesn't hurt you, hurt you that bad, uh, but, it, but it's just overcomplicated. Uh, but you should really, really think about how many times your application calls apply. And, uh, and then, of course, that's the one side of it. And the other side of it is uh, how fast is the apply loop to call. So, and that's, that's a good place to start there is to say, so you should default to uh, using one-time bindings where you, put a, where you put two commas in front of your bindings. What that will actually do is uh, set up a binding that's going to be undefined as it starts out. Then when the data comes in, it will put in the data and then it will unsubscribe from the, from the binding. So it will only give you the initial data after it's undefined. Uh, so that's, you should do that for everything. Like that should be your starting place. And then if you ever need something, you can, take, you can remove them again. So don't do it the other way around. Start by making everything one-time one bindings and then you know, take them away if you really, really need them to. That will help your performance a lot. But actually, it still, it, it, that won't help the initial, initial load of your page or the initial template crawling because you know, it'll still set up, the, set up the listener and wait for the data to be there and then put in, put in the data and then unsubscribe the listener. So it'll actually take a little bit uh, time still. So if you, like I said here, maybe you can just put the data directly in the template string. So I thought I would make an example and just say, so if you can do this instead of doing curly brackets uh, for a binding, uh, you don't need any binding. That, this will load a lot faster up front. And then when I said one time binding and one way binding, I was almost myself, f you know, f getting mixing these concepts up in my head. So I thought I would just make it straight. One time bindings and one way bindings are not the same. One time bindings are what you just saw, where you put, you know, two colons in front of the name. It'll only update the bindings when it when it goes from undefined to a value, and then it won't ever touch it again. So that's one time binding. One way binding is what we saw when we were, use, when we were doing the component where, where there's the, the funny triangle. Um, and, uh, and, and what that means uh, is not what you think it is. So a lot of us thought when, the, when this was introduced with components in AngularJS 1.5 that this meant we had some kind of uh, immutable data kind of thing in AngularJS, but it's not. So I actually built a demo, and maybe I'll show it at the end, or maybe you can find it uh, depending on how much time we have. Maybe you can just look it up in the, in the slides afterwards. But one-way bindings are just a special input binding uh, for components. Um, so the only way it's different from two-way bindings are when you change the reference from within a component, it, it's the reference is, is not changed outside the component. So any, anything you change inside the element is gonna be it's still going to be reflected up because it's JavaScript and it's the same identity of the object. So it's not immutable. It's not a copy of the object. It's still the same object being parsed down. It's just that if you, from inside your component, change the reference to a different object, 
that object won't be reflected outside of the uh, component if it's a one-way binding. So I think a lot of us has had, had this you know, mixed up in our heads when we started with AngularJS and one-way one uh, bindings. But I've tried to you know, think about it a lot and try to explain it, and I, I, hope, I hope it makes sense. Uh, if not, you can ask questions afterwards, or we can, we can check out the demo. Then there's a, a little one that's, uh, you know, I've said curly braces a lot. There's curly braces everywhere in every documentation of AngularJS, but really, you probably don't want to use curly braces. So uh, when you can, and most of the time you can, you should use the bindings that are from the directives. You should use ng-bind or something. Uh, that will use, that will probably be what you want, because you're probably, unless you're doing really, really weird stuff where you can't mix nodes with elements because of your styling or something, you probably want to just put it on an element and put the ng-binding on it instead. And the reason is that that expression is cached, and it's not cached when it's on when it's inside curly brackets. It should be just an implementation detail, and they I think they should be able to fix it, but it's still that way. So this is not a big thing, but if you if you if you use filters on your, um, especially if you use filters on your on your bindings, uh, you you will get some performance out of not using curly brackets. So if uh, this is for probably the easiest one to just go home and use. So uh, do that tomorrow. Go home and change all your bindings to just be ng-bind on, on an element, and that will give you a little bit. And don't use ng-include. ng-include is, you know, uh, it's really handy because you can just give it a, you know, a, a, a URL to a template, and it will just render that template out. Uh, but it turns out, like in my head, that should be the same or maybe even faster than you know, giving it a component and having the component have a template, have the same template. But it's not. And that, that comes down to how it's implemented and stuff. But it's almost twice as fast to use a subcomponent than to use ng-include. So I built a demo where there's like a thousand items uh, with ng-include and a thousand items with components. And it, the, the performance is almost, uh, it's almost twice as fast. So that's also a pretty easy win to go home and do. So if you're, if, like, if you're sub-modularizing with ng-include everywhere in your application, you prob should probably think about refactoring that into sub-components instead. And then there's, you know, remember to clean up. I said before, if you don't need apply, you probably don't want ng-click or ng-something. Uh, the good thing about that is that they'll clean up after themselves. Uh, so if you're adding event listeners yourself, you have to remove them yourself, and uh, and that's a pretty good, uh, you know, a pretty good place to uh, to start. So on components, there's a non-destroy callback. Uh, if you're using something that's not a component and you don't have those lifecycle hooks, the same callback is on every every scope. So that's a, a valid excuse again for actually using the scope, is that if you want to listen for the uh, destroy event. Uh, so if you're listening for that, then you should clean up after yourself in there. So that would be uh, pointers to uh, big events that are big objects, um, event listeners. Uh, if you're using the event system, like I'm using here, uh, I'm subscribing to root scope uh, test, blah, blah, blah. I'm subscribed. And then I'm unsubscribing in the undestroy method. And this will actually work. I have a demo here. If you click that uh, afterwards, if you want to play with it, you can see I've made a repeater where I put this in a million times, where so you can just add more and more and more and more, and you can then fire events and see that they're that they're being fired. And then when you remove them again, if if you haven't uh, off the the you know the the listener, they'll still be there. And not only will they fire events that aren't used, but it'll also take up memory. So if you're building a single page application, uh, that might end up be a problem for you. Filters in your template uh, is also a, 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 a performance uh, problem or a performance issue um, somewhere because they're run more often than you think. Uh, so I talked before about how apply is called uh, multiple times. Uh, and uh, you should think that, uh, that filters would just be called once and then cached or something. But uh, obviously, because uh, because the data we we only can we can only do we can only cache the value of, of what's returned from the filter. So every time anything is changed, every time apply is called, uh, we'll actually rerun the filter to see if the filtered value is still what the filtered value was before. 
So uh, that's a pretty big uh, thing as well. So you probably don't want that. So I thought I would, I would answer the question and say, so how would you do that? So here I'm making uh, two references to dates. And uh, in the one example, I'm filtering it in the view. And in the other example, I'm filtering it in, in the controller. If I'm doing it in the controller, it's just as easy to do. And, it, and I'm in control of how often the filter is run. I know that the date filter is not really that expensive, but if you're doing custom filtering or anything, you probably don't want that. You probably don't want that to happen all the time. You probably want to be in control of when it happens. Then there's ng-repeat. This is probably one of the biggest wins. One-time bindings on whatever you're repeating on is probably going to help you so much you won't even believe it. Uh, like you're obvious, like a lot of the times we're, you know, doing long lists of something and then we're doing something that's not related to the list somewhere else. And because there is a long list with a lot of bindings, everything's slow. But if we put the, the two dots in front of this, the list or the repeater won't be checked because it's only once when it goes from undefined to having a value. And that will give us a lot of, of, of win. So that's probably the easiest, probably the second easiest win than if ng-bind was the easiest one. Uh, you pr you most of the time, you'd want to use this. Uh, track by, uh, yeah, that's a good idea as well. Um, then, so that, that, that's, you know, that's kind of the end of, uh, of uh, performance and issues around scopes and why it's hard and why it's weird. So now, a little bit of the slides I have left is, uh, is a little bit more general in uh, to maybe to maybe some would say to web development or development in all or but it's it's been a lot of it's been a part of my journey and, and where we've come to uh, so I thought I'd share it anyway you should think about TypeScript so if you wanna if you're if you want to do angular uh, and uh, you should you, you should just definitely use TypeScript don't use angular without TypeScript uh, angular JS uh, you can use without TypeScript. Did I? Yeah. Sorry. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, we get a lot of, uh, of ES6 stuff just because it's a comp compiler like, or a transpiler like Babel or something, so we get ES6 support. But we also get all the type support. So if uh, we're a big .NET house on the back end, and uh, that we have features that will actually take our server-side models and do uh, TypeScript definitions from them. So we can have type safety on our AJAX responses and all that stuff. And that really, really helps when we build ap applications on large teams where the backend thinks he can just change something on a web service and it won't break anything. Uh, now he'll actually, you know, the, his build won't complete because now we'll know that uh, we're trying to use something that's no longer in the response or something. So that's really powerful. TypeScript is, is really, really cool. It, it helps you a lot. I would say consider observables. Um, we started using observables in a couple of projects uh, within the last you know, year or so. And observables are, are one of the cornerstones of Angular. Uh, and um, and you know, the more you work with them, the more awesome they are. So it's, they're super fun to work with. You have to, there's a little bit of getting your head around how they work and, and how it works with, with all your stuff. But the, like the question from before of uh, what do we do w instead of watchers, because we need to be informed whenever something changes, a lot of where we thought we needed to use watchers was so easily refactored into observables, because you can just subscribe to, to changes, and you'll be notified whenever something changes. And they don't call apply, uh, you, so you can manually do it. So if you're, uh, if you're into that, you should check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and if you're into Angular, uh, you, you, you're going to need to to learn it anyway. Then there's uh, modules, you know, for most programming languages or most front end, you know, solutions are think about this. So how should we handle modularizing our code? Uh, and I, I, I didn't put any advice here. I just said you should think about modules because uh, you know there's. There's not necessarily a, a right way to do it. Uh, I would say I really, uh, I kind of like ES6 modules. Uh, but as you know, or as you might know, um, they can't really run the browser themselves. We need a runtime for that, and that's, that kind of sucks. Uh, Angular modules, or for AngularJS modules, what they're called, Angular modules, 
Uh, modules for AngularJS is a thing, but in AngularJS, uh, dependencies and modules is maybe more or less just a big bucket where everything that's added is just put inside the bucket and then you pull it up from that again. So it, it's not really a module system. It's only like the, the most important part you get from modules in AngularJS is testability. So if you want to test just a sub feature of your application, you don't need to bootstrap the entire application. You can just bootstrap a part of it. So it'll make your test run faster and a little bit simpler, uh, you know, better. But uh, at runtime for the user, the user won't see any difference. So you might as well just put everything on one Angular module. Or you might use Angular modules as the only module system and just load everything else in a big blob of JavaScript. Uh, I'll just say consider it. Uh, and consider the trade-offs. Do we need a loader? Do we not? How, how big is the win for it? And what kind of modules are the right for us? And if you want advice, you should come. You, you can come talk to me uh, afterwards, and and I'll give you my candid uh, approach to modules. Uh, then I'd say manage your state consistently. Think about maybe Redux for your application. Redux can work uh, pretty well with AngularJS. Uh, observables, uh, again, a pretty cool way to to handle your data, uh, or your data flow, or your states. Um, Maybe build your own, but I would say manage it in a consistent way. So don't use some approaches somewhere and other approaches otherwhere, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, I won't say too much about that. I've spent almost all my time now. So commit to a naming scheme, especially if you're on the big teams. Uh, it's really, really cool if you can, you know, agree on what files file names are and uh, if files are grouped by feature or by type or by whatever. Uh, Variable names, uh, method names, and you know, regular JavaScript linting stuff. Uh, when to you know use curly brackets and when not, and all that stuff. I would say avoid using ng in your own names. Avoid using the dollar sign in your own uh, methods or, or yeah in your own names. Uh, just because like if you can, because it it won't break anything unless you override some of Angular Angular's own methods, Angular JS. Um, but it's just uh, it's just not obvious for for people outside if this is an internal method or it's an external method or something. So avoid using those in your own names. Uh, I know at Impact we're a big uh, we used to do this a lot, so uh, we still have a lot of refactoring to do on on older stuff. <laughs> and then there's a. A uh, thing I like uh, for when you use dependency injection, uh, use dependency like put them on separate lines because uh, we'll have uh, better uh, diffs in our, our Git or whatever version system we have, so we can actually see what dependencies are are added, and it's not just one long string of uh, or one long you know uh, list of of dependencies. So put them on separate lines. Uh, yeah, that goes for Angular as well, um, and use the newest Angular JS release. So. There's been a couple of breaking changes, and they're generally pretty easy to fix. So if what, whenever there's a new version, you should go check out the change log. It's really, really small. Like it's it's typically, you know, within one piece of paper, uh, and you can see uh, what breaking changes, if any, there are. And most of the time, they're so edge case that they won't they won't change your application at all. But they will make it a lot faster and more secure. So you you probably you probably should just uh, use it. At least you should just try it out and see if it if it breaks. It's so fast to do. The last thing on my slide is running AngularJS in production. So obviously, we have to do all the stuff that we normally do. You know, maybe concat the files, minify them, uh, use gzip, and all that stuff. Um, but you actually, Angular comes with a uh, AngularJS <coughs> comes with a. Uh, comes with production bundles and a, not pr and a non production bundle. And they're actually different. So, a lot of us, are, or uh, me as well, uh, for years and years, I've just been minifying the, the, the development build uh, and used that for production. But the difference is that um, some features, some, the main, the main difference is that all the error messages are really long and verbose in the development version, and they're absolutely nothing more or less just a link in the production version. So the binary is just smaller. Uh, so it's, you, you should absolutely just use the, the production build for production. And if you want to use 
only one version, you should just use the production build for development as well, because you can just click the link and it'll take you to a place that will show the error message. Um, so do that. Um, then there are uh, ways you can turn off the debugging info that will actually give you a little bit of performance as well. So you know when you go to a page that's built with Angular uh, or any page, you can generally just open up the dev tools on your computer and you can see if it's built with Angular because it has ng-scope everywhere and all those helper classes and all that crap. Uh, but that actually, that's actually not needed. Uh, there's, a, there's an option, if you follow the production link uh, tutorial on, on the AngularJS website, uh, they, they tell you how to turn, turn it off and it'll actually help you a little bit on performance. It's not a big thing because it's just class names more or less, uh, but it, you should just do it. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. I read an article the other day uh, when I figured this out, and he said he went through the top 100 or something uh, pages on the Built with Angular JS website, uh, and there's like two of them that had this feature actually, that knew about this feature or that had the, these uh, turned off. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something that, prob that most of people don't know, uh, but you should probably do it. It's, it's, it's pretty easy, it's just a config uh, thing. Same goes for uh, comment and class directives. That's one of the features of Angular JS that is uh, that I don't see a lot of people using. So I don't see a lot of people that has uh, you know class names uh, as selectors for directives or comments as selector for directives. Uh, so if you don't do that, you can turn them off, and the compiler will be a little bit faster because it doesn't need to to look for that. Uh, and there's just uh, you know compile time or config time uh, flags as well. So you should look into that, uh, it'll help you out a little bit more. And uh, with that, I think we'll, I'll open it up for discussion, we'll, we'll talk, uh, maybe somebody uh, think I've, I've missed something or have questions or something. So, hit me. <laughs>